record? Yeah, it's record. Uh, okay, so uh, for the multiple choice section, once you start, we have to finish right away, right? So, uh, but the way, let me uh, share my screen and go over it. Uh, if you were on yesterday's class, we talked about it, but we're gonna be talking uh, tomorrow at class as well. So we're gonna release the exam on uh, Thursday after class. And you have all week to do it. Like you, ha you can, uh, you can uh, start it all week uh, to like next class or next Thursday's class. But once you start it, yeah, you have three hours to complete, okay? Although, uh, let's be honest, I think you guys are gonna be done like in 40, 40 minutes or an hour or an hour uh, at most, okay? So yeah, once you start, you, should be, you, you need to uh, get it done in three hours. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing here, uh, I'm going to send you guys a link here in the chat, and I'll post that the link as well. Uh, let me just copy here. So would you guys please access this uh, link and see if you can access here uh, the practice. It's called like midterm practice. By the way, like. Uh, Feel free to like talk right now because I, I I feel like it's gonna be more uh, like the more questions you're gonna you guys are gonna have like I guess uh, more would be like helpful for you guys I, I think otherwise I will try to go over those questions uh, which is pretty much like the midterm like the multiple choices and we have also like one open-ended questions that we are gonna be talking in the end of this section as well uh, on the same file the, the, he has over there. So uh, I saw a bunch of guys access it here on uh, the, the link. Can you guys access or do you guys have it in hands or? Yeah, anything? we can access it. Cool, so I'm gonna move on. If you guys have questions, please interrupt me, okay? Uh, so let me share my screen and make it easier. So I don't know who just joined. Uh, there is, if you guys, could uh, just copy and paste the link if someone uh, joined, please. So uh, we don't have, uh, I don't have to do that because I might not realize, but if you just joined, please open that link that is on the chat with uh, the practice, midterm practice, okay? So are you guys sharing my screen? Or are you guys sharing? No, are you guys seeing my screen here? I have a yes, please, or no. Let me see that. I need to get the chat back. Hang on. There you go, yes, thanks. Uh, okay, so uh, this first part is, uh, as we said, like mostly uh, multiple choices, but the way that we're gonna go over here, it's uh, maybe we're gonna answer, I'm gonna like provide you the answer, uh, but you should be able to, uh, I actually, you, I encourage you to make a copy here to your drive so you can type your answers, right? Because uh, I'm not gonna, give you uh, like this practice midterm with the answer key for that. So I'm gonna go over it right now, right? So uh, just do a copy here and then you can type your answers or download it and type it, right? So uh, let's get going. Uh, so this is a table that you guys will be seeing in the midterm, right? Uh, you might have more assets, but the thing is we always gonna say like, okay, this is some data uh, regarding one asset or two and other or the market. So we, we're always going to tell you which asset you should use as the market, right? Which uh, it's important, right? Uh, so for here part, uh, panel A here have returns and risk. Uh, we have some annualized returns and risk and uh, some blanks here. Uh, then we are also going to give you the results of a cap M regression, right? Uh, that you're going to be using that or to answer some questions. So first question, you will be seeing that, right? So uh, be sure you know how to annualize, uh, what are the annualized mean or geo mean and standard deviation for asset one. So uh, remember, first thing that you're gonna do, or geo mean or returns, it's, uh, I put everything in red, so we better. It's one plus the return raised to uh, n 
minus one, where n will be equal number of periods in a year. So for now, uh, this table uh, you should be able to read here and have uh, here uh, saying that it is monthly data. When is monthly data? Uh, can you zoom in, please? Yeah, definitely. Uh, let me just see if I can go like this. Is that better? Hope that's better. Uh, okay. Uh, so yeah, if you just joined, remember to get the, the link here the, that I shared on the, the chat. If you don't have access to this document, you should should have. So I don't know. Anyway, so annualizing here returns uh, n is the number of periods in a year because it's monthly data. Then n equals twelve. So you guys have done that on uh, homework very straightforward but uh if you had weekly data over here you would use n equal 52 right 52 weeks in a year if it was daily 251 or sorry two five uh yeah 251 yeah uh, but in this case here you would use n uh, equal 12 so you would do so the mean the do mean here is 0.9 so one plus 0. 9%, which is 2.09, raised to 12 minus one, which equals, you guys have a calculator either, or just open it, shall I do that? I think somebody just entered, uh, you should be able to open the document we are seeing using the link here in the chat. So we equal one plus nine, 12 minus one, 1.81. Is that right? Yep. So I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. So where did you get the 0 0.09 from? Okay, sorry. So let me see if I'm looking at the right uh, place here. So 0 0.09, it's, uh, oh, I am analyzing this one. So yeah, you're right. So it should be using this 0.88%, right? So I'm analyzing the market uh, data. Is that what the question says? Asset one, that's the thing, market, I'm, my bad. Uh, but yeah, so I got here from uh, the monthly data, GeoMe, right? Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so it's not 0.9 because I'm doing the market, so it's 0.88 and 0.88 is going to be a, that number, right? I didn't do anything wrong. Then standard deviation. For analyzing standard deviation, remember the formula here will be like square root of n times the standard deviation, All right? Uh, so in this case, monthly standard deviation here, 7.5 percent, .75 equals square root of 12. Remember, because we have monthly data. And that so it's 25.98 percent. Point ninety-eight percent. And actually this guy here, it's got a few things that I have done something wrong here in a point eight percent. Yeah, I got something wrong there. I'm gonna put that as percentage. You guys feel, feel free and please interrupt me if that doesn't make sense because I'm kind of doing that on the fly. Okay, so then that looks a little bit better, I guess. 
Uh, so you should be able to do, get those results. The, the thing is with the multiple choices, you might find like five answers saying like, I don't know, 11 and 25 or 25 and 11, 10 and four, and you should be able to select that, right? Uh, now, we ask here, what's the sharp ratio for the asset one? So sharp ratio, if you guys remember, uh, expected returns and this is not like supposed to be tricky, but the risk-free asset annual returns is what you uh, you were given. So you should be able, should be using annual returns here as well, right? If you would uh, have, uh, give you like monthly risk-free asset returns, which we won't, okay? But uh, you you'd be using monthly data. So here, 11.35 is the returns and 2.5. So let's do it here, 11.35%. Uh, and 2.5%, so sharp ratio returns minus risk-free divided by its standard deviation 20.78, this one by 20.78%, point forty two five. Let me write down the formula here, but you guys probably would know that uh, sharp Turn minus three turns and my asset and deviation. Okay. Uh, then we ask what is alpha and beta for asset one? And first first thing that you, you guys are probably or might be wondering is there is no correlation coefficient here for me to calculate beta. And that's why we gave you the summary output of the CAPM regression analysis on fund one here or asset one, or if you have more, you have one for each, but you should be able to find here, uh, over here, alpha and beta, right? So just by looking at the table or the, the results, okay? So the intercept is always alpha. Let me put that in red. Which is equal to 0 0.0069. And beta coefficient. This is coefficient over here. It might be a different name here. But if it's the cap M regression, you, you will know that this second coefficient, our only coefficient is beta, right? So 1.35. Okay. Uh, okay, so just building that up a little bit on that, you might ask you, what is alpha and what is its interpretation? Can someone give me the interpretation here on alpha? The cap, this cap M alpha for this fund? Someone? Are you guys there too? Is it that since alpha is greater than zero, it um, over from the market kit perfect. benchmark? Yeah, perfect. So you would find like because is greater than zero. I would just say that way, but what I said is also true. It, it, this asset outperformed the market or had excess returns over the market. Okay. So yeah, greater than zero. Now beta. significant and then a risky asset say that again please it uh since the p-value is zero it's significant um and then it's a risky ask asset yeah you're absolutely right 
you, you went actually a little bit over, like uh, if you don't say anything about the significance, I mean, you don't feel, feel like you have to mention that, but I'm glad you did. Uh, but the interpretation here, perfect, you can interpret its significance, but the coefficient itself being greater than one is what causes, as you said, it, it being uh, riskier compared to the market, right? So a good way to like say that is uh, because it's greater than one, so I'm gonna provide like two, because it's the, my thing like this. Because it's greater than one, if you hold the market portfolio, this asset would bring more risk to it. Another way to think is uh, this asset, asset returns are amplified or sensitive to market moving. And I'm just uh, putting that, the only key thing that you, uh, you might like, not change, but uh, in your words, like kind of uh, be not like super well interpret, uh, have a not like very neat interpretation is that beta is always with relation to the market, right? You cannot say like this asset is riskier because that, that would mean like all risk and this is standard deviation, okay? So beta is the risk uh, adjusted for the market or the, the, the risk compared to the market risk, right? So just quick note here, but yeah, the, your, your interpretation is good. And if we don't say anything about the coefficient, it's zero. Uh, it's, you don't have to say, but uh, I'm just gonna treat that over here, right? So now we ask, how do you know alpha and beta of the market? W what are those? So if you look here, if you give you guys a fund and say treat that as the market, or we say this is the market, what is alpha and beta for that? Yeah, so the beta of the market is always one. That's how you know, like you don't even need a uh, regression or anything for beta. Now what's the market uh, alpha? Well, if you look at the cap M regression, you shouldn't have any alpha, right? Because it's the market and the market won't outperform itself. So it's gonna be zero, okay? Uh, and the interpretation that you can say like, why? it's because it's the market, like simple as that, okay? So if you say like, okay, uh, we have this 500 uh, index fund, treat that as the market, is because we are treating that as the market, the justification for that, okay? But so alpha under the CAPM model here for a market, always zero and beta always equal one, perfect. And that's why beta greater than one or, or less than one, it's, uh, brings more or less risk to the, the portfolio. Now, was alpha of asset one statistically significant at 10%, right? So now you should be able to come back here at the, so this is asset one, and we are talking about alpha, right? So uh, let me just draw that. Alpha, yeah, it's this guy here, intercept, and you would look here at the p-value to see if it's significant. Right, and we said on the question, and we, we always will, unless you wanna make your judgment, like uh, if it, we don't say anything, you can consider whatever confidence interval you want, but we said 10%, right? So if P is lower than 10%, it's significant. If P is greater than 10%, it's not statistically significant, right? So it's, 0 0.05, uh, 0.25, sorry, this is equal to 25%, right? So uh, back into the question, you would say, what was alpha? Was alpha, I said, no. It's P value was equal to 25%. Okay, so if, if the question was, is alpha significant at 50%, 
okay, uh, you probably won't see that, but uh, you could say that it is, right? And again, you might see, I mean, we are like writing the answer, but you might see that as like a multiple question, right? So yes, no, uh, okay. Uh, how would you, uh, how would these, the process used to create a mutual fund and an ETF, how they differ? That's the, the key here, how they differ. Someone know that this one? Okay, it, it grows at, uh, yeah, I mean, okay, but uh, like the process for creating that, that's what I am uh, kind of looking for. So the key difference here, uh, I think, uh, I lost the chat, hang on. Looking for the chat. There you go. Okay. Uh, for ETFs, the difference is uh, the fund first buy its assets and then sell its shares for uh, shareholders, right? So first buy its shares and then sell to shareholders. And mutual funds, they do the opposite. So first they sell shares and then with that money, they allocate that on uh, on on assets. Okay, so first sell shares and then buy yes. Okay. Uh, so again, you might see that, and one not tricky again, but uh, we said here like mutual fund and ETF. If we give you a table over here, we'll say like which assets are those. So let's say here it's the v, uh, VFINX, the Vanguard 500 uh, fund here. We will say here, this is an ETF that tracks. So we might ask you, uh, what is the process of creating this and that fund? And you should be able to look here and see if it's an ETF or a mutual fund, but it, we will give you that information as well. Okay, but this is the difference on creating that. Uh, okay, market sharp ratio is 0.33. What is the best interpretation of that? Can someone uh, say that? And again, I'm, I'm trying to like get you guys to talk because I feel like it's very helpful when you say that with your words. And plus, you might make me think of something related that I forgot here to say or that might be worth it. Someone has a like interpretation of the sharp ratio here. Someone? Uh, for every unit of risk, uh, it gives the access returns of the units over the risk-free asset. Perfect, so the, the key point there, as you said, like excess return over the risk-free asset. So if you see like 0.33 excess returns over the market, wrong, over another asset, no, it's over, remember the formula, sharp, equal uh, 
turns minus risk free asset turns. Plus Uh, question down here, which asset would you expect to have a higher returns under the cap and pricing model and why? So remember the cap and uh, pricing model. The returns of asset A equal risk-free returns plus eta times market returns over the risk-free returns. So what, which asset here are, or those here, market or uh, this fund one, would you expect to have a higher uh, expected return according to the CAPM pricing model? So remember the only difference, the only thing that, that uh, is used to uh, predict prices here or returns on the CAPM uh, pricing model is beta. So which one has the, has, uh, has the highest beta will be the one with the highest, uh, the highest returns here. And since as the, One has beta equal to infinite five. And we'll have very weak. Got it? Okay. Uh, so moving on, uh, we have here uh, now a summary output of the fund one still. Right, or uh, but now we are using the three-factor model. For those who are in uh, tomorrow's uh, session, we are going to be talking about uh, the homework, and we're going to be talking about it uh, in class. Uh, but we will ask you, or probably we will ask you here, uh, give you the the results of this regression, and you should be able to interpret some things of that. Right, so. First here, what is the SMB, small over large stocks, excess returns coefficient, and what does that tells you? So, it, first, of thing, first of all, you need to look at the coefficient, minus 0.44, uh, which means, is there someone here that uh, was yesterday in class or did homework and remember from the videos? What does that mean? What does it tell you? This particular coefficient over here? I'm gonna say here, but I hope that it's clear because if you don't understand like the intuition behind and the question is presented in a slightly different way, you might, uh, you might not, not get it right. So hopefully you guys got it and I'm, I'm gonna answer here, but I encourage you to try to do that and make sense of that. But because it's negative, uh, it means Well, it might be a, another coefficient. It might be a different coefficient. That's what I'm saying, for instance, right? So uh, you should get the intuition on that. Uh, so because it's negative, it means that when 
small stocks are underperforming large stocks because remember this S minus uh, large or small minus large is the excess returns of small stocks over large stocks. So, so the way that you can interpret that when small stocks are underperforming large stocks, the fund is doing well. It's likely to be doing well, right? So you could also say the, the opposite, right? So when small stocks are outperforming large stocks, the fund is not likely to be doing well, okay? So this is what it tells you, uh, H, ML. So basically you're getting a portfolio of uh, value stocks and another portfolio of, of uh, growth stocks, right? High uh, book to market ratio. And you are doing the same thing that we did, for instance, when you are regressing that and you are getting the funds returns minus the risk-free asset. This is uh, value stocks portfolio minus growth stocks portfolio. So what do you see? Uh, if you had the data, you would see the excess returns of value stocks over growth stocks. So the coefficient here, you should be able to find it here. It's minus 0.98. Negative two. It means that when value stocks are outperforming, they're growth stocks this fund is likely to not be doing the same thing uh, the opposite if growth stocks then are outperforming value stocks this fund is likely to be doing well. Does that make sense? So think of that the relationship between them is negative. So if you have hold everything constant but that, uh, it's a negative correlation. So when value stocks are outper outperforming growth stocks, because it's a negative correlation, right? Uh, the fund is not doing well. So you can interpret it that mean like saying either one. You could also have like slightly change that, but if you got the intuition, you won't uh, get it wrong. And again, this will probably be multiple choice. So you might see like likely to be, not likely to be, and should be able to interpret that. Uh, you could also have interpret the coefficients here, uh, but probably on betas we won't ask anything we might an alpha and alpha here is not significant as well right uh so beta for market so it's the market minus the risk free is the same of this the cap and beta it's 1.35 and it's the same interpretation that we got uh from beta here and it turns out that to be the same, but they might be different. Maybe on the cap M, it was 1.35. And when you run the three factor model is like 1.2, right? Uh, but the interpretation is exactly the same. Okay. 1.35. Okay, so what's the interpretation of alpha here uh, under the three factor model for SF1? Uh, if someone just joined, remember to access this link here for the document that we are working on. So the interpretation of, of the alpha is the same. It's slightly different, like the interpretation here would be like it's positive. So it has excess returns. 
although the p-value is quite high, so you wouldn't be uh, significant, statistically significant at some, until like 45%. So you wouldn't be at 10%, for instance, right? Uh, so you say here it's positive, and 0, 0, 0.049, is that right? 0, 0, 0.049, yeah. Means this as a, uh, outperform its benchmark. And a good thing to add when you're talking about the three factor model is after considering its investment style. This is my words, okay, but you can explain that differently. But the thing is, you are controlling for uh, other characteristics on its investment style of small growth and value, or sorry, small, big value growth. Uh, so after controlling for that, is still outperformance benchmark, benchmark, although it's not significant at 10%. And again, we didn't ask you, so if you didn't ask anything about the, if it's statistically significant, you didn't have to uh, provide it. I'm just doing it here because hope you guys uh, understand that, All right? So, yeah, questions here on alpha and then, oh, finally, why alpha under the three-factor model is lower than the alpha for the, the, the cap end. Uh, so it's, remember, uh, on the three-factor model, the alpha, it's adjusted, uh, it's adjusted by uh, it, the, the fund investment style, right? Because it has other factors there. So it is lower on this case, I, I believe 0, 0, 0.9, 0.9 or 0049 versus 0069. So after considering its investment style, its benchmark was a little bit, was increased a little bit. That's why alpha, it's uh, the excess return is a little bit lower. So a good maybe explanation, again, this is my word. You should be able to get this intuition. It's because after considering its investment style, Benchmark increased a little bit. And the intuition behind is try to think on uh, a fund that invests in small and growth stocks or small and value stocks, which are known to outperform large and, and growth stocks. So when you analyze it using the cap M, he might actually deliver excess returns, but of course, because small stocks and value stocks uh, were I know to outperform its peers, right? So it's not that exact actually having excess returns is just riskier. Remember, like if you the the, the line on the beta on uh, portfolios in different sizes, small uh, stocks have a higher beta. So it's just it might be just a matter of taking more risk and not really excess returns. And that's why when you adjust for that and control for that factor it might change a little bit and change its benchmark a little bit, okay? So this is kind of my explanation why. Uh, no question here, no anything. Okay. Um, okay, question 16 here. Asset A has average arithmetic returns of 10% and a standard deviation of 20. Asset B has average uh, arithmetic returns of 10% and a standard deviation of 30. Which, which one of those would you expect to have, to have the biggest difference between its mean, the arithmetic mean, and geo mean, and why? Someone know this one? Or could, or say something here on this one? I'm gonna try to feel like, hey.
this is kind of like how you might see that on the, the exam, right? On the midterm, multiple choices. When what would be the the answer here for this question? Which one of those? High average return have much higher geo means. Yeah. Uh, so if you have a higher average, you might have a higher geo mean as well. Uh, however, like while which asset is expected to have the biggest difference between its mean and its geo mean? So I'm not talking like comparing those two assets, is comparing them with themselves. Which one will have like, I don't know, the average is 10, this geo mean will be nine and this will be eight. Like, is this what you're gonna be expecting or impossible to know or? Hopefully you guys are just shy, <laughs> but remember uh, the, the difference between the mean and the geo mean gets bigger uh, as the volatility of the asset is higher, right? So in that case, uh, you would expect asset B to have uh, the biggest difference between its mean. So its geo mean will be lower uh, than asset A because they have the same return. But if it was something like that, the, the difference between its mean and its geo mean will be higher as the standard deviation will be higher, okay? So this one will be, and actually if they both had just like positive returns, you might not see that, but if there's one single negative returns on that period, then the geo mean will be lower. And then the greater the volatility, the greater the difference between the mean and the geo mean, okay? Uh, what best describes market efficient or efficiency? Again, we're gonna be, I think we talked about it last class or yesterday. If you are on the Thursday's class, you're gonna be talking about that tomorrow. But if you believe in market efficiency or what is what describes market efficiency, good way to think about it is remember, if you believe that you cannot beat the market and why not? Uh, because it basically says that all public information, it's already uh, reflected in the prices, right? So uh, why would you pick a stock if it's already reflecting all public information of that, right? So uh, this, is, this is what market efficiency uh, means. And the description here, it's kind of personal, I'll put mine here, but uh, it means that, or, all public, right? Because we're not going to be dealing with uh, inside information. Is reflected in prices already. Okay. Uh, okay. So you might see something like this as well in the test. Uh, so we give you a table with four funds here, A, B, C, and D. So it's not. Uh, here on the header, but uh, pretend here A, B, C, D, and we give you guys a couple of characteristics on those funds, right? So stocks for all of them, uh, income, blend, and growth. Let me try to put something here. My my help. Uh, just. I'll put that on there now. My gallery. Profile over here. So we're talking about that box that is coming up. Maybe not. There you go. And So income, blend and growth, large, major, small cap, index or active management, right? Those. And we are asking you, so let me just place it here so you guys can remember. Which of these funds are likely to have lower cost fees than others and why? So by looking at those, uh, how would you make that call and which one of those, or you can say two of them, 
right? Uh, would have or would you expect to have uh, lower cost like fees? C. C. Yeah. Why? Uh, it's uh, income and uh, large, so and it's indexed too, so it's going to take the least amount of work to to work with. Okay. So lower the, lower returns as well. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so like lower returns, lower risk. Although the fees, it's actually like just because it's index, so you can compare like index and active. Okay. So you would say like maybe A and C here. I would put because both have indexes here. Maybe this one is following, I don't know, uh, this, this one SP 500 and this one the SP, I don't know, small cap. It's not small because it's large, but uh, it's a slightly different index, right? So uh, both indexes, index fund usually uh, have lower fees than others, okay? It's, it's index. But then what, what is said here, uh, I'm gonna jump into 20. What are the following better uh, ranks? The funds from highest to lowest risk. So like, I'll put this rank the funds from highest to lowest risk. So as you said, like C here, incoming large will be uh, the least risk that you can, you can have, right? Which is gonna be like a little bit more riskier. Growth. Yeah, so you have to look at two characteristics, just uh, income, blending growth, but also large, medium, small cap. So if you think, uh, again, we talked about it yesterday. So you might be seeing that tomorrow if you're on Thursdays, but growth in large, most risky. If, when you talk here, large, medium, small, value, blend growth, this direction here is risk, right? So uh, you have make make a call like based on those two. So value here or income, the same. So this one is the least risk. So let me see that. So least risk. Then you have those two that are large, so they're kind of tied, but this one is blend and this is growth. So this one has a little bit of income, a little bit of growth, and this is just growth. So this is the more risk one. This here will be the second. And hang on on this one, uh, blend and large. I think I'm not doing any mistake here. So this is the first one for sure. Then you have large, large, large land growth. This one actually, it's from last year's, I think, mid, uh, midterm. And which one would be riskier here between blend and large and growth and mid? Blend large, growth and mid. Growth and mid, I'd say. So actually like, remember the risk thing over here? They are kind of the same, right? So it's kind of difficult to say. Uh, so in this case, like those fun two, like those two ones will be like the same. I would, rank them as the same and growth, uh, or sorry, growth large, blend, mid and growth, mid growth, growth blend, growth large, and where's the other one? One is over here, over here, over here, and oh, I forgot the other one, growth and large. Growth and life. 
So those three you can rank for sure, but those few you, you can't. But you should be able to find that this two will be like in between this one, which is the minimum risk and hang on, am I saying it right? No, I'll get confused again. Let me restart that and work that with, through, uh, through that with you guys. Okay, so income large is the first one for sure, right? Income and large. Then we have blend and large. Let me see if that's the second one. Blend, large. I have income large. Well, income large is the blend large. Growth meat and growth large. Growth meat, yeah. And growth large. So as you move in that direction, it's more risky. Move in that direction, it's more risky. This one will be the most, second, third, and fourth. Does that make sense? I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I made a confusion here. It's, it's, uh, you need to thank him on that. Hopefully I'm not wrong here. You guys agree with me? Yes, does that make sense? Because I'm literally doing that with you guys right now. <laughs> okay. Because uh, confused. Yeah, let's try to do that again over here. So let me draw on that and clear. So if you go to value or income to growth, this is more risky than this one. Right. If you have large and small, this is riskier and than this. So far, so good. Okay. Now we have uh, those four funds here. I'm gonna have to zoom out. Just I'm gonna actually not have to, but so we can see everything on the same screen over here. Okay. Now let's call this A, B, C, and D. Uh, which one has the least risk of them? So least that, one, that you can have is value and large. And value is the same for income. So this is C over here, right? So let's do our classification here, plus C is here, thank you, Elise. Uh, are more riskier? Like, which is the, the riskiest one of them here? Do you want to put this B, growth me? A, bland, large, and growth large. B. B is the most risky, right? You guys agree with that? So, is the one that goes more to the right and more down here. So B will be over all the way here, right? So this one we did, this one we did. Now between those two, which one is riskier between them? So they are on the same uh, size here. They're both large, but then this is the tiebreaker. So yep, uh, D here because it's growth will have a little bit more risk and a over here so that would be the answer is it clear now does that make sense cool uh yeah it, it, it gets it, it is a little bit tricky you guys saw me all confused here i'm sorry about it but uh if you have like doubts, just plot them as we did here on the, the morning box, uh, the morning star category box, and it will help. So this is gonna be B, highest, and I don't remember anymore. It's A, B, C, 
right? Hold for this, sorry. Okay, now 19, which funds would you likely, would likely be held by people that believe in market efficiency and why? So again, you can pick two if you want. But what, what is market efficiency? And if you believe in that, what do you believe? Remember, you believe that you cannot beat the market. So what do you do? Just buy the market, <laughs> right? Uh, so here, if you believe in market efficiency, you would just buy index funds and try to keep your costs low because there's no point in investing on active management since you cannot beat the market, right? So uh, you would pick A and C or, or, or C. So A or and C. Got it? All right, so uh, we got in here to an end. By the way, there's 24 questions on the midterm, uh, multiple choices. Uh, you might be given a, an efficient frontier like this or different. And you might be asked, why is the EV frontier kind of bold a little bit to the left? You guys know what is uh, bold to the left? Like, I can make another one if you guys want, but uh, so remember here, I have SA1 and SA2. What would be the case that the, the efficient frontier will be like a straight line? You guys remember from, I think, homework two, the two SA? If correlation coefficient between them is equal one, it's gonna be a straight line. Uh, if the correlation coefficient is uh, lower than one, uh, but not minus one for let's say zero, then you're gonna be seeing it kind of bowing like this. So it's uh, lower than one. Now, if finally it happens to be minus one, oops, which, you won't find it probably, but it will be all the way here touching the this ax axis and coming back. So essentially you have like a risk-free portfolio if you have a correlation coefficient of minus one between them. So because it's a little bit kind of bold to the left, the explanation for that, it's uh, because Assets in the EV frontier have correlation lower than one. Okay. So they're not perfectly correlated. They offer some uh, risk diversification benefits, and that's why it's a little bit bold to the left. Okay. Let's put that in red. Uh, is there, if there was only those risky assets, because you can see there is no risk-free asset in here. If there was only these risky assets to pick, why would an individual have the minimum volatility portfolio? So minimum volatility portfolio in this case, all the way on the standard deviation to the left, is this one over here. So if there's no risk-free asset, why would someone choose to be on that position why would someone hold that portfolio and not this one here for instance Oh yeah, sorry. So one reason that uh, he would be on the minimum volatility portfolio on that case that you just have risky assets is because he's risk averse. As 
his risk preferences are uh, more towards like risk loving, he would hold like riskier portfolios at the EV frontier, right? So uh, that's why he would hold the minimum volatility portfolio. Now, if an individual that believes in the market that is efficient, or not here, but had these assets and the risk-free asset, CBUs, what portfolio would he pick? Does someone know what portfolio over the EV frontier, if he had a risk-free asset, would uh, this guy pick? Someone have a guess? So remember what we are talking about here. We have standard deviation and returns, and you have some assets, and you you, you got the the efficiency frontier here, or the EV frontier. Sorry, of those assets. You have the minimum volatility over here, max uh, return for that level, uh, given level of risk, and you have here the risk-free asset. Which portfolio would this individual uh, hold along the EV frontier to mix with this risk-free asset uh, over here? So you guys remember that if you go to that direction, further that is better, right? You have a better uh, return to standard deviation or return to risk uh, ratio, right? And what is return or risk uh, to, uh, or return, yeah, adjusted for risk. This is sharp ratio, remember? So he would pick like the place on that line that has the highest sharp ratio. So he would be on, uh, mix that with the risk-free asset and somewhere over here will be like his allocation between the risk-free asset and that combination, right? If he's more risk uh, loving, he might have more of that portfolio in, in instead of the risk-free rate. And he's, if he's more risk averse, he will have minus uh, of that portfolio and more risk-free rate, but he will be uh, over here if he believes that markets are efficient and you have this risk reward, uh, this risk reward configuration. So over here, you can you can tell for sure where is the mark sharp ratio here, but it should be able to like not even without even like looking at that, uh, the max sharp ratio portfolio. Oh, and mix with the risk-free asset according to its risk preferences. Does that make sense, guys? I hope so. Okay, uh, now question 25. Uh, consider those two assets, returns and risk, those two, uh, same annualized returns and different volatility, right? This is slightly lower, okay? Which asset would you prefer to put on your portfolio? Or how would you approach that problem in the first moment here? Would you do a sharp ratio? Would you just look at their analyzed return, just at their uh, volatility? So it's clear that this is lower, this is the same. Okay, so the second one has the highest sharp. 
right? So yeah, perfect. You would pick that one. However, uh, you would not pick the one just because of the sharp ratio, right? So here it's impossible to know. And right, right. And the reason of that is because you don't know your portfolio and you would need the correlation coefficient between them to see if uh, asset one or two would be a, like would give a best uh, risk benefit for your portfolio. So uh, if we ask like, is this true? Like if you have two assets and one has uh, the highest sharp ratio, uh, is it preferred to an asset with the lowest sharp ratio in your portfolio? The answer would be like, depend on my portfolio. I think about that. If I hold just tech stocks and I'm bringing Apple to that, Apple has a very high sharp ratio, or would you prefer to have maybe, I don't know, a bond fund or a, I don't know, a fund that invests in gold that has a lower sharp ratio, but a correlation coefficient, uh, which is very, very lower than the Apple with your portfolio, right? I hope that that, that is making sense for you guys. So the answer here depends on the correlation with my portfolio. Okay, then you can make a call and see, okay, uh, I will put this or that portfolio or that asset into my portfolio, okay? Uh, okay, over here, I think this is what we had on the lecture notes once, okay, so I'm not gonna go over it, uh, but if you guys, well, let me do that real quick. Uh, so what is the total return between that period, right? So you have here, remember, always use the adjusted close price and period return equal uh, November 1, the price divided by, so it's the whole period, right? Or October 1st here. So October 1st, adjust price, and you can do it minus one because you want the total return between those two periods. So it's just one period. Hope that makes sense. Now the second question, it's slightly different. Uh, then it's the monthly return to that. So then you would use uh, return equal uh, last adjusted price, divided by first adjusted price, and one divided by N minus one, and equal number of periods. And you would count here, so like October 1st, so it's have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, skip the dividend, right? Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So 12, and remember take one out of that because you want the intervals, the monthly. Uh, so n, n equals 11. Okay, I'm not gonna go over that calculation, but difference between monthly returns and total return. Okay, so it's total return is just one period to other. And what are the two parts of total return? Remember for, I think, first homework, capital gains and current gain, dividend. So did they have both during this past last year? Yeah, it had dividends. And you would say here that the adjusted close price, or it's up and down, so it's the opposite. Okay, so tricky over here. Uh, yeah. And because it started with 17 here on the adjusted price and and back here on the 16th, or you can look at the close and there was no capital gains. Uh, it was losses, but yeah, it had capital and current uh, both over here, right? So uh, yeah, that was uh, the, the, the multiple part. And this is the, how the, the, the open-ended question will look like. So I think in like 10 minutes we can get over that. So like 
okay, you have asset one and asset two, and we might ask you to draw this correlation, uh, this EV frontier here, uh, considering a correlation equal one, zero, or minus one. So remember we did it. So the EV frontier, standard deviation, and returns. Uh, 29, yeah. Current gains and, and capital gains. So uh, this is like the open-ended kind of like it look it will look like. Uh, you could do it like very like okay, this is thirty-five percent. This is thirty. Uh, let me try to do it a little bit bigger for you guys. And twelve percent, twelve percent, so twelve and thirty-five, and those are two assets. And if correlation equals one, the EV frontier will be a straight line. If correlation equals zero, remember in between one and minus one, it, you don't have to get it right. Exactly, but it has to be bold to the left. If you did it like this, this, like this, that's fine. <laughs> you have to just you get the intuition that if you have a correlation coefficient here, you have risk benefits and you will kind of be bold towards your left, right? Finally, if it was minus one, then you have to go all the way here, touch it at some point in between those returns and come back. Right, because uh, if you have two assets with a correlation coefficient between minus one, you can do pretty much a uh, risk-free portfolio, right? Because uh, when one loses, the other wins, and the other way around as well. So if both wins on average, you don't have risk at all, right? So uh, if those returns are positive, uh, you will always win. So this is the three possibilities of the EV frontier, okay? On the midterm, that is uh, a question open-ended like uh, for the EV frontier. If you don't want to draw and you want to use that uh, homework one, remember, uh, homework two, I think, key review, yeah. There's the, the two asset portfolio thing there. You can as well, okay. So if you're, if you're not sure, you can go here and go one and see this is one minus one and see how how it is changing. I probably have something wrong here, right? And let me put here on the standard deviation. There you go. Mm -hmm. So you could have put it there and see what's the shape of that. Okay. Uh, and if you're asked to draw, you can also like copy that and paste there. Okay, so don't feel like you have to build another one you want to use that that's perfectly fine unless you have the intuition behind it and you got it right uh, so uh, if you are advising a risk averse person uh, and you have available those two assets assume that the correlation is 0.35 okay so let me put it there just so we can uh, have a clear and the risk free asset is 2.5 and a return so 20 25 and 2.5 the other guy is uh, 12, 30. Correlation 0.35, risk-free asset, this. Uh, how clear, clear all. So this is the, the, the thing that we are saying here. And where's the, yep, over here. Would you recommend, how would you recommend a portfolio for that person. So you, it's saying that you have two risky assets with the correlation between them of 0.35 and you have a risk-free asset, right? So what would you do here? Okay, you have uh, the risk-free asset, which is 0.25 is over here. 
again, don't feel like you have to uh, draw it perfectly, but the intuition here is your EV frontier here, your portfolio should be allocated on that line that touches here the max sharp ratio. And you could have looked here, in that case, the max sharp ratio is actually uh, this over here. So 90% of one, so it'll be almost here. And somewhere in between here will be your allocation, right? Now we said that is a risk averse person. So we would say, I would put in between uh, the max sharp ratio portfolio and the risk-free asset. And I'll probably put greater part of that on the risk-free asset, right? So you could say that, uh, again, this is my word, but this is an open-ended question. And the goal here is for you to understand that uh, no matter what's the risk preference of that person, right? If you have a risk-free asset and risky assets, you're gonna draw the EV frontier of them. And the combination here, the, the market efficient, uh, efficient says here, right, if you believe in that, uh, that the, the most like efficient portfolio that you're gonna have is a combination between the, between the risk-free asset over here and the tangency point of this EV frontier, which is the max sharp ratio point, okay? So this is the intuition. And then across the line, you're gonna allocate those assets according to your or your client's risk preference. Okay, so if you set like 20% in uh, that assets and 80 on the risk-free asset or set 30 and 70, that's okay, you know? But the intuition uh, is that you have to be holding that portfolio with the risk-free asset uh, at some proportion according to the risk preference, okay? So this is the intuition behind it. And finally, if you recommend this portfolio, what are some important assumptions that you're making on that? Uh, can someone say like a couple important assumptions that we are doing here? Let's say I'm, I'm recommending you to be over here. I don't know, here, 50-50. So you're gonna be 50% on risk-free asset, 50% on this Mark Sharp portfolio, okay, which is 0.9 on way one and 0.2 on asset two. Uh, what are the assumptions that we are doing or, or that we are relying on while uh, making all that calculations, intuition and doing that recommendation? Can someone say a few assumptions here, or one or two, I don't know. Try to think on uh, where did this annual returns came from? So what is the big assumption that we are doing here? Right, uh, so biggest assumptions that we are doing is you got to hold. So I look at historical data or somehow I come up with evaluation. I don't know and I say, okay, asset one, we return 0.5%. So this is your portfolio. Now, what if asset one actually returns 10%? Maybe on that, if, if you do that, the ratio is completely changed and it should be holding some, like just 45% of that and not 90 right so you are making uh assumption that your inputs standard deviation and correlation coefficient will be held let's say or will be achieved if you're looking at historical data the assumption is that this asset will perform as it did on the last 20 years, right? But you're making that assumption while uh, making that recommendation. And you gotta make it clear, right? Cause I mean, this is an optimization problem, which is kind of easy, but 
remember garbage in garbage out on any model so if you have like a very bad estimation of the expected return there is no optimization problem that will solve that okay uh with that i think i covered everything i try to go slowly uh we took one hour and 20 minutes but uh, i think on the actual exam you're gonna go those multiple choice answers and probably be done in less than an hour and the open-ended question would be something like those three here probably like one page at max uh, that you should be able to explain this intuition on the EV frontier or how to allocate a portfolio with between risk-free asset and risky asset right and assumptions that you're making okay I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and ask you if you guys have further questions or you want me to go back at some point or oh yeah no you're welcome man uh, hopefully it uh, was helpful and if you stick with that and you know what what we just covered you should be able to score like 100 easy <laughs> on the test okay no surprises so uh yeah that's it Specific, is there any specific homeworks or lectures that would be helpful to look over? Uh, I would say like review the homework keys, okay? Make sure that you understand uh, uh, the answers. And I would stick with that, uh, that, that midterm practice. So if you don't know one question specifically of that, please look at that question add the material okay so there is no like a specific homework or something there are pretty much all homeworks here so if you don't know a term or something uh go back but use this as a guide i think that's a good guide and yeah uh i will go back on question number two so let me share my screen again so he gave you that question one and question two okay what is the sharp ratio for asset one? Please insert them. I'll be like this. Hang on, because I lost the chat. Let me know if you're seeing something. Uh, thanks. Okay. So, just a second. Brian, Brian, is he still there? Did you get question two? Got it. Also, you skipped 26, okay. I'm gonna go over 26 in a minute. And I'll go ahead and uh, stop how we evaluate CAPM. I mean, let me just see 26 real quick. Oh, yeah, so 26 is, uh, yeah, and this is not a question. <laughs> So this is the, the announcement for the table and those three questions, okay. Uh, now, Manish, can you be more specific on how do we evaluate CAPM? You mean like the regression or you mean? Uh, you, you're talking about the regression? Just confirm if you're talking about it or not. CAPM returns and regression. Okay, got it. Uh, so when it's done, uh, what it, you're going to be looking here is this, which is alpha, and this, which is beta. Okay. Uh, the coefficients here are the numbers for alpha and beta. So alpha 0069, beta 1.35. Okay, this is what you look at the CAPM regression analysis. Now further, uh, you wanna look at the statistical uh, significance by looking at its p-value, right? So let's pick a p-value as, as in the question. So uh, 10%. And let's p-value. For alpha it's 0.25 and beta is zero. So to analyze the p-value, you will see if it's 
if it's lower than let's say 10 percent that we got here lower than it's significant if p is greater than 10% and we said 10% in the question, but if you say 5%, you're gonna replace that by 5%, okay? Then it's not statistically significant, okay? Uh, so here, 0.25, it's 25%, right? Is greater than 10%, so it's not statistically significant. And beta is zero, it's lower than 10%. It is statistically different, uh, uh, significant. So we would say, okay, this asset here had a positive alpha, right? So remember alpha means excess returns, uh, in this case through the market or the benchmark. Uh, so this asset uh, on that period of time had excess returns over the market. However, that excess return is not statistically significant or is not statistically different than zero okay so this is the how p-value plays a role here so although it is positive it's not significant so statistically is the same as zero so you're saying statistically at five percent level of confidence this asset did not outperform the market okay uh, and same thing for the beta you could have done that and same thing you would do this interpretation on the, the three-factor model, you would just be using here alpha. This is beta one or beta the market, beta two, beta three. And those are the p-values that you can understand exactly like the same. Positive alpha, it had excess returns. However, very high p-value, 45% greater than 10%, statistically, not significant, statistically not different than zero. So this asset did not outperform its benchmark, statistically speaking, okay? Does that answer your question? Yep. Okay, do you guys have further questions or uh, comments here regarding the midterm? I have a few more minutes here anyway, so. Uh, Otherwise, I think I will then stop recording and you guys feel free to uh, 